Hello and welcome to Photographic Connections, the podcast where we create connection to self, nature and others through the art of photography. My name is Kim Grant, the founder of Photographic Connections and your host for this podcast. And today I'm delighted to welcome Mary Ann Karen onto the podcast. Mary is an American wildlife photographer, best known for her bird images photographed at the Great Salt Lake. She shares why birds are of particular interest to her, how she immerses herself in the scene when creating her images, as well as how she's developed empathy for her subjects. Mary Ann is on a mission to use her photography in order to raise awareness about the importance of the lake for migrating birds and how the changing climate is very quickly decreasing its water levels. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mary Ann Karen. Hi, Marianne. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast this week. I'm really looking forward to speaking with you because you have such a passion for photographing birds in your your local area um, of the, the Great Salt Lake. And I think your story is incredibly inspiring in many respects. And your images are so, so beautiful. And there's a much greater meaning to your work as well, which we're going to dive into today. But before we do all of that, I wondered if you could go way back to the beginning of your photography journey and share what got you into photography in the first place. Sure. Um, thank you for all that. And thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. It'll be fun. So, um, yeah, uh, I started with, um, photography, I guess the, my first interest in photography was I was 12 and I had a Polaroid camera and I was really excited to go take pictures of animals at, we lived kind of on a farm and went out there and shot, you know, the entire roll full of like, sheep that were completely underexposed, you know, couldn't see any of it. And um, I gave up on it. After looking at all of those photos, I was like, well, this is complete and absolute crap. And I didn't think about it again until um, I was, um, I had a jewelry business. Um, this was 10 or 15 years ago now. And I was selling, making and selling jewelry online. So I had to take photos and um Similar kind of experience. I started taking photos of my jewelry and thinking, this is complete crap. I hate this. <laughs> and I spent, um, you know, many, many hours throwing out photos and feeling, you know, completely discouraged about the photography. But at one point I got um, just sort of by luck, I managed to capture a nice photo of a pair of earrings and they were kind of backlit and they were glowing and they had an aura and there was this scene that was just beautiful. And it was, they were, they looked, you know, magical. And I, I think I sold like 40 pairs of those earrings like right away. And I, and and it sort of clicked in my mind. Um, wow, you know, with photography, you can capture a magic that, you know, um, and and you can sell, right? Like you can capture a magic and portray that in such a way that people really respond to it. You know, the earrings didn't change. It was only the image. Um, And just like that, it's like you have people's attention, right? And that was sort of a moment when I thought, I should really think about photography. And then I put it away and I didn't think about it. I'm, you know, I got a job back in my regular business and didn't think about it again for a long time, another probably 10 years. Um, but it was sort of in the back of my mind that, you know, maybe maybe I'll be a landscape photographer. Maybe I'll um, pick up photography again at some point. And um, we were planning a trip to Belize right around the time the pandemic hit. And I thought, oh, maybe it'll be fun to take pictures of the wildlife when we're in Belize. I did some, um, you know, Googling as to like what sort of lens I should bring. And I was like, oh yeah, no, no, I'm not, (laughs) I can't can't do that. Right. Like I can't afford a telephoto lens. Um, and then the pandemic hit and our trip was canceled and I took that budget and I was like, why not? All right. I'm going to, I'm going to buy this lens. And it was, uh, an incredible, um, good fortune that I did because then I was able to spend that entire like weird, stressful time of the pandemic, Outside, you know, learning a, a new hobby, a new passion, um, connecting with wildlife, which, um, you know, I hadn't done before. And so I really started wildlife photography during the pandemic. That's when I really figured out how to operate the camera and, you know, got a kit that was um, really nice. And, um, you know, that's when I that's when I got passionate about it. 
I hadn't realised that you were so new to doing what you're currently doing with with photographing the birds in your local area and with wildlife photography. I, yeah, that's incredible how quickly you've come along with photography in that time and the incredible journey you've been on and the stories that you now go on to tell. So I guess one thing I'd really be interested in knowing is what do you think it is about wildlife photography in particular that interests you? Well, I've always um, loved being out in nature. That's really fun. But I've also always um, wanted a little bit something else, like a a little more than just being in nature. Um, You know, like I used to um, do triathlons or, you know, events, or I used to um, do a number of outdoor sports. And so I've always sort of um, looked for that extra piece um, that wasn't simply being in and enjoying nature, but also learning a skill, practicing, you know, um, some kind of an activity, right? Like I've always sort of looked for an activity in nature. Um, And so photography was a really good fit and especially bird and wildlife photography, because, um, you know, I've never been a hunter, but I've always loved animals. I didn't grow up um, with any sort of animal related outlet, um, except for growing up a little bit on a farm. I guess that kind of counts. But um, I've always wanted to understand animals at a deeper level and um, to know sort of their ways and and, um, be a bit more of a naturalist in that way, but didn't really have a a way to do that. And so this has been, um, you know, an incredible, like immersive learning experience on behavior and um, understanding creatures in their environment and their, um, you know, their needs and their habitats and um, their interactions with each other. So on top of that, it's just really exciting um, to be eye to eye with a wild animal. I mean, you're looking at a bird and they're not super close, but they'll come, you know, really close. And you're looking at them through your telephoto lens and they're just giant. And like you can see their heart beating and you can see their breathing and their little feathers ruffling. Um, and so there's just, I think, a level of excitement and maybe adrenaline to that that um, I don't get from other kinds of photography. Like certainly jewelry wasn't doing that for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a connection with another um, living creature. You know, it's looking into the eyes of someone who is other, but also so very same and um, trying to make that, you know, um, trying to just sort of understand, like you look into their eyes and you see yourself for a moment. And and, uh, it's a really neat, um, it's a really fun experience. It's all that sense of oneness, isn't it? I love that you spoke there about being able to see their heartbeat and them breathing and looking into their eyes. And I know when I photograph, the only birds I tend to do a lot of photography around is seabirds here in the summer. And I just love looking, as you say, in their eyes when they're looking back at you and you really feel something and it's, it's a beautiful connection. And of course, you've mentioned there about your, the birds you photograph, and that's what, of course, you're most well known for photographing. So why do you think birds out of all the wildlife species out there, you know, what is it about them particularly that, that really speaks to you? I'm not sure if it's they're more interesting to me than other wildlife species, but they are very available. Um, so, you know, in the pandemic, I was working around my job and my kids school and you just maybe have a few minutes and the light's only good at a certain period of time. And um, so you're sort of popping outside and who's around? It's birds. Right. Um, or you're um, you're going to the park for a walk and who's there? Birds. Right. There are always birds in our urban areas. There are wildlife that um, does tend to be really available to us. And, um, you know, I think uh, people who are really into birds, they talk about their spark bird, like the bird that changed everything for them and made them understand that like birds really are the center of the universe. Um, And for me, it was just uh, one day sort of laying in the mud in the park, just the neighborhood park. And there were ducks that people had been feeding. And, you know, this duck walked up to me and... um, again, looking straight into their eyes. And then my kid, you know, ran into the water and scared and it flew. And I captured this picture, you know, of it with its full wing spread and all this feather detail. It was just, I was swinging like my camera around wildly. It was just complete luck. But um, I captured that picture and, you know, I looked, opened it up on my computer and it was like, my heart stopped. I was like, wow, this is, this is it. Like, this is it. I, I want to do this. And um, so, yeah, those that combination of things, their availability and just their stunning, um, their, their aesthetic is incredibly beautiful. They're elegant. You know, um, they're enough different that they're fascinating to me, I think. Um, but there's still a, a real connection there um, in terms of just being 
you know, a thinking, feeling being that you can really kind of relate to, but different enough that sometimes you're like, wow, this is prehistoric feeling or, you know, um, yeah, fascinating, um, available. I, I always think, you know, I'm like pretty close to Yellowstone. We have elk, we have all sorts of creatures in the mountains nearby. Like, oh, I should go chase the rut or I should, you know, I see pictures of big horns taken close by and I'm like, yeah, I should do that. And then um, next thing I know, I'm in the mud staring at birds. Like, I don't know, <laughs> I'm just not tired of it yet. <laughs> I don't have enough pictures of birds yet. Maybe when I do, I'll start, um, start after some other wildlife. It's so beautiful that you go out there and photograph what's readily available to you because, you know, there's so many people that will want to travel a lot or go to a lot of places and are waiting for those moments when they can go out and photograph the things that they feel really speak to them. But I love that you've been able to find something that, as you say, is so readily available to you and so abundant. And to to go on then to, to tell these stories, I'd love you to go in a little bit about this about saving uh, the Great Salt Lake because, you know, it's a fantastic resource that's home to millions of, of birds and other species. So what drew you particularly to the Great Salt Lake and the work that you're doing now around that? Well, I have lived in Salt Lake City, named after the Great Salt Lake in Utah, um, for 25 years, a long time. And I had been out to the Great Salt Lake, but it's kind of a difficult place to love. It's not the kind of place you go out, you know, with flip flops and a beach towel. Um, it can be really muddy. It can, there's a like bugs, you know, it's marshy, it's swampy. Um, it smells like it's really not an easy place to recreate on the way you typically think of lakes. So the local, you know, um, sense of Great Salt Lake is like, it's gross. It's a wasteland. It's salty. We can't use the water. Um, you know, it's 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 basically a dumping ground for everything that we don't want. Um, so that's been sort of the feeling about Great Salt Lake for a very long time. And um, at the same time, I had heard, you know, but I'd been out there and I thought it was absolutely stunning, but I didn't really have a lot of reason to go there because like it's kind of, you know, it's hard to, it's just a hard place to recreate unless you're a hunter or something. At the same time, I had heard, you know, just, oh, it's a great place for birds. And so when I got into bird photography, I was like, all right, I better go back out there and see what I can see because um, now I'm really into birds. So this might be my place. And um, so I went back out there and uh, I think it was... A, day in June and it was completely still, no wind, but there were these huge towering cumulus clouds. We just had a big thunderstorm. Um, so there were these big cumulus clouds and the lake has this really like long, wide open views and um, incredibly reflective properties. I think the high salt makes it, maybe makes it more reflective or something. Anyway, you get these mirror images and I saw the American Avocets out there in the water, just like walking in the clouds on this mirror surface. And it was so surreal and trippy. And I, I kind of was like, what is this place? And I walked out there and I like, you know, I'm a, I'm a beginner. I've been taking photos for three or four months at this point, right? And snapped a, a shot that, uh, you know, I took like five or, or 10 or something. And then I, I went on my way. But it was a similar thing when I got home, I was like, I had managed to capture not just the bird, but this time sort of immersed in this incredible in environment. And that aesthetic was something that I was like, oh, I didn't quite nail it here, but I see it, right? Like, so the lake captured me for its aesthetic. So this combination of like, oh, I really love birds, but now I, I found this place that's like, I've never seen anything like it. And I don't see photographs like that. Um, and so I've you know, became fascinated with the lake aesthetically. And then the combination of having birds there, of course, just made it um, better for me. So I, I got really um, kind of obsessed with like recapturing that um, scene that I couldn't describe, right? And it sort of knocked my socks off. Um, and so I started going out there and within maybe six months, I realized, oh, um, this is disappearing, right? Like this had kind of been going on in the background, like scientists had been sort of sounding the alarm, Great Salt Lake is drying up, we have to change our ways, you know, it's gonna be gone. Um, and I think it was maybe a year after I'd been starting to take photos there um, and the lake was just, every time I'd go out, 
it was many hundreds of yards further out to get to the birds, right? Or there was just less water available. And all of this dry lake bed just being exposed, cracked mud. And, and I realized, like, oh, this is real. Like, this is happening. This isn't some far out thing, you know, that's going to be, you know, 10 or 20 years if we don't change our ways. Like, this is now. Um, Great Salt Lake is disappearing. And um, I, I have maybe a year or two to, to do this work, um, you know, to capture this aesthetic that I'm so obsessed with, like, okay, well, if, if I'm going to do this, I better do it now. And so that's when I sort of started spending most of my photography time at the lake trying to capture, um, you know, what was there before it was gone. And it is true by 2022, by the summer of 2022, um, those big wide open water scenes were really almost impossible to get um, because you just couldn't get to the water. Uh, it was just too far away. So um, luckily we had a huge um, winter last winter. Um, we got our a record snowpack, which did bring the lake back up to about 2021 levels. So it set the clock back maybe two years. Um, so we have a little more time and, um, you know, been out there a bunch this year. Again, in that situation where like, this could be my last year, who knows, you know, better take advantage of it. So that's a long version of a short question. <laughs> no, it's, it's brilliant. It's lovely to hear the story behind everything and, and everything you're noticing, because that's quite a dramatic change you've been noticing in such a short period of time. You know, it's not like you've been photographing this lake for, you know, decades. It's like, you know, this has been over like a two or three year time period. And yeah, it, it's quite something, I think, to see these changes in nature. It can be quite shocking at times. And I, I was in Canada recently and I was around Harrison Lake and it has receded quite a bit this year because they've had like, I mean, as you'll know, you know, a lot of wildfires and stuff in Canada, but they've had like hardly any rainfall. And this huge lake is just like, you know, the water level was so low and I had to wade out so far before I could even start swimming. And that was quite shocking for them. They said, you know, some people had said they'd never seen it so low. So it definitely seems to be happening a lot around, um, you know, your sort of part of the world between America and both Canada. And yeah, how do you feel, I think, noticing that in this lake that you love so much? Well, every time I go out there and I see, you know, the water farther and farther away, I, it's, it's really hard, right? Like it's a gut punch because you realize that that all translates to lost bird habitat. And um, I think I hadn't fully appreciated how important Great Salt Lake is for birds until I started doing the photography out there. But it is really um, sort of the, uh, the linchpin habitat for certain types of birds in the entire sort of American West, this portion of the West that we're in. It's, um, it's in the smack in the middle of the desert. It's this really incredibly rich ecosystem. So they use it on their migration up to Canada. So a bunch of shorebirds, especially, and waterfowl that are migrating from South America stop here on their way to, you know, the Arctic Circle where they do their breeding um, and on the way back. And um, it's really the only thing like it. And it's the only remaining habitat like it in the West. So, um, and it's very, it's very big. Um, you know, there's a network of saline lakes, but a lot of them are much smaller and they've dried up already or they're ephemeral at this point. Maybe they appear in a wet year, but they're not there all the time. So Great Salt Lake is one of sort of like the last big saline lake regionally. Um, and, you know, it's supporting a huge number of birds. So if it goes, um, there, there will be species that will disappear or will, you know, be candidates for endangered species listings because they rely on it so heavily. So, um, so yeah, I, uh, that worries me greatly because it's a huge, um, piece of both the Pacific flyway, which is where birds are coming up along, you know, the Pacific coast of South America, um, Mexico, California, um, and heading up North into BC and, and Alaska. Right. Um, so it's a big chunk of that, um, flyway. And then it also um, sees birds from the central flyway. So all the birds that are coming up through the, you know, the middle of the country also stop by here. Um, so, yeah, it worries me. It worries me significantly. And I, and I like to say um, Great Salt Lake is probably, you know, may, maybe a place that you've never heard of or thought of. Um, but you've probably met a bird from that's been here, um, you know, and if Great Salt Lake disappears, like these are your birds. And this is your problem, right? Because this is not a small number of birds. Um, it's going to have global impact if it disappears. 
That's one thing people don't always realise. They see the birds in their home country, in their home area, and they don't always think about where those birds have come from and all the places they've stopped off on to get there. And yeah, this is, you know, not just a, an issue in your area, you know, like you say, if that if it dries up, it can be an issue for, for bird species from all over the place. And I think what you've been doing here, you know, not only doing the photography, but learning so much about it, it's really giving you almost like a purpose with your, your photography work. And I think I, I saw a documentary on your, your website this morning uh, and about your kind of what you're doing here and your photography and one thing that really struck me and you'd mentioned it a little bit a little while ago about how immersive being out there is for you and I love that not only you're not one of these photographers that stands on the edge of of the lake with zooming in you literally put on waders and you wade into the water and you crawl in the mud to get your images and you truly are immersing yourself in that environment I mean that must be almost like a very therapeutic thing to do do you find that? Absolutely. Um, like I said, I never wanted to be a hunter, but I always admire, I, I think I always was a little bit envious of um, the people who were hunters that are, you know, following animals and really understanding their habitat and understanding their world. Um, and, and it never appealed to me, um, but this this part of it does, right? Um, so it is very therapeutic. I do really love being out there at the same time, you know, that sort of um, immersive, shall we say, photography isn't going to be, you know, for everyone. And it's not for me all the time either. Sometimes I'm like, I just can't, I can't do it. I, I can't handle the cleanup right now. Like I want something easy, right? <laughs> so it's not always like that. Um, but it's a lot of fun. And there's a, there's a spirit of adventure to that, that um, is also just a lot of fun. You know, it's, you kind of get all of the, um, I don't know, there are, you know, there are mountaineers and, you know, extreme sports people. And, you know, they're pursuing all of these sort of crazy, uncomfortable things because of this sense of adventure, right? And it's like, wow, this is really exciting. Well, for me, this is like a, a really, um, like a low stakes version of that. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, it's muddy, it's gross, but it's not like dangerous, right? I mean, I could get stuck in the mud, but that's, you know, that's probably the worst of it. Um, so, you know, it's a way to really feel like I'm kind of pushing my limits and having a lot of fun. But in, in reality, you know, my car is just like you know, less than a mile away or something, you know, like it's not, it, it's not extreme in, in that way. So it kind of scratches that, um, you know, that itch. I know you've had other people on that have talked about back issues and I've had similar things and, you know, I can't do some of the more maybe aggressive things that I once did. And so this is like wildlife photography is like as much or as little um, adventure as you want, right? Like you can just do it from your car um, or you can get out there and really, um, you know, crawl through the muck and, you know, put yourself out there and in the rain and the storms and whatever else, right? It's kind of choose your own adventure that way. It's a lot of fun. Mm. I love it because I've always seen photography as an adventure but I guess for me it's like an adventure of going for a walk and just seeing what I can discover it's like that childlike wonder of what am I going to see today what am I going to discover what treasures am I going to find but I just there was just something about you doing that that it just it really spoke to me or made me see photography in a different way because it's almost like it doesn't have to just be about the images it's about what else can we do to make it more I don't know, more adventurous, but also to really immerse ourselves more in the experience. Like one thing I do a lot is walk around barefoot on the beach and maybe go in the water barefoot, which, you know, isn't going to be great where you are, for instance. It'd be incredibly mucky and you want to keep yourself, um, you know, covered up with everything. But I just, I love that you found a way to interact with that environment in a way that works for you, but that also gives you that close immersion. I think especially as the lake is, is receding, because, you know, as you say, the water is getting further and further away. And that's giving you the opportunity to get close to the water and still connect with the birds that, that are still there. I love what you said about, you know, wearing the muck boots. I was out there. Um, I, I take a few um, students out, um, do some workshops. I was out there with um, some students and we, you know, it was kind of a stormy night and uh, it was kind of cold and we had geared up and we were all wearing our, you know, muck boots and our like somewhat ridiculous like camo jackets and bug nets and, and we had all of our gear and we started walking out into the lake and then a wedding photographer stopped pretty much pretty right 
pretty much right next to us. And the bride, they're doing a shoot out on the lake. A lot of wedding photographers shoot on Great Salt Lake because of those stunning visuals that you just can't, it's really hard to get anywhere else. Um, And the bride comes out in this little, beautiful little white flowing short dress and she's barefoot and her hair is like flowers and she goes running out into the lake you know and in this like doing little pirouettes and I'm just thinking man that photo session must be epic like she's getting some incredible epic and we're like trudging by in all of our gear and our waiters we're like hey how are you <laughs> don't mind us <laughs> so so there are multiple ways to enjoy it but uh, yeah it was a funny moment yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I'm just laughing just hearing you um, you going back over that event. It seems almost very surreal. <laughs> it was quite surreal. I was like, wow, sorry to get in the way of your shot. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be by in just, just a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, there was a really interesting or really thought provoking thing that you said in the, the documentary that I watched earlier today. And it said, there's nothing else that I do that makes me sit in one place in nature and observe so closely. And that was you referring, of course, to photography. So I wondered if you could maybe delve into this a little bit further. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I think for my entire life, I've spent most of my time passing through wild places. Um, I'm either walking through or running through or on a bike or, you know, any number of ways, driving, whatever. But you're getting from one place to the next and it's very sort of mission oriented. um, And uh, when you're doing photography, and I think this, this counts with any kind of nature photography, but especially wildlife photography, you really do have to just find your spot and hold still and you've got to be patient and you've got to be really observant and um, so it's a very different way of appreciating nature than everything else I had ever done because when you're sitting there and you're either waiting for the birds to show up or you're waiting for them to decide that you're not a threat or you're um, you know simply waiting for the light to get good and you're in position um or you're, you know, you're waiting for the birds to do a particular behavior that you've been hoping to catch. Um, you're really seeing it. You're seeing time pass by in a, it, it, instead of, you know, you passing through nature, it's like nature is passing by you and you're getting to watch um, things a little bit like a fly on the wall and seeing and understanding what's going on at a deeper level than I think you do from that superficial um, moving through the area kind of perspective that I'd always had. So I really love I I love that piece of it. And um, I need photography for that. I'm not um, I'm I'm too antsy to um, just go into the woods and sit on a rock, you know, and pay attention. Right. Like Uh, I wouldn't probably do that um, without, you know, the goal of I want to catch a photo of this particular, you know, situation. So I need to be patient. I need to wait. So it slows it slows you down. It it causes you to really, really pay attention. I think you the nature of the witness that you can provide when you've spent that many hours just really paying attention to what's going on changes. Um, It it becomes it becomes a, a different you, you get, you have, you learn a different perspective and then you can portray that. And, I, and it's something that I've been um, really enjoying um, delving into. Mm. I think we all have the capability and, and the ability to go into these moments of, of stillness and to really connect with the world. But for many people, they often need that tool. And it's very clear that, that picking up a camera has, has given you that. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially a telephoto lens, that's been the key for me. (laughs) Yes. So what do you think? Like a telephoto lens, of course, you're zooming into things and you're really getting to see things up close. It is a struggle to get to, you know, otherwise. But what do you think it is about a telephoto lens? Because I personally have started having such a deep connection with mine, not always for, for wildlife, but sometimes just zooming into nature because it gives you a completely different perspective, doesn't it? It does. And I think, um, you know, at this point, I've spent a lot of time with my trusty 500 millimeter f4 lens, um, and I'm trying to set it down and be more creative and use other lenses more often. So that's a caveat to it. But every time I pick it up, I just, you know, what it does is, you know, it it allows you essentially to focus, right? It allows you to kind of eliminate all of, you know, a lot of the surroundings because it's zooming in on such a small area. 
you know, and because, um, you know, when you have a longer focal length, the background is blurred out, you know, you're able to focus even more on a particular subject, whatever it is that you're focusing on. Um, and it, it really allows you to, to sort of like eliminate distractions, both in the image, but also, um, I think in your mind, you know, you can really, um, you know, target in on the creature and, and pay very close attention to what's going on. And, um, I just love that. I love looking through the telephoto lens. It's to me, I get out a wide angle lens and I'm like, yeah, that's pretty. But, um, then I get bored pretty quickly and I want to move on. Um, whereas when I'm, you know, I feel like I could take photos with my, my big telephoto lens, as long as there's a subject, you know, in the frame, I could do that all day. It's just a lot of fun for me. Mm -hmm. I quite often feel that when we use our wide angle lens that there's almost like a hundred photographs within that image that, that we could then go on to to connect with and different subjects and different ideas. And, you know, the beauty of that telephoto lens is you're getting to connect with all those hundreds of subjects. Of course, in your case, it's it's picking out certain birds, but it's almost like it just it gives you that that, like I say, viewpoint that you wouldn't otherwise get and there's just there's something so beautiful about that that seeing these moments that most people would walk by but then also getting to see them so up close and almost intimately isn't there absolutely and I really um I just love the look I mean it's not you know I think probably what is 50 millimeters or 35 millimeters is is what the human eye sees is that right I think it's maybe it's 35 right so wider angle than that is sort of like it's a little bit of a distortion of our you know reality and in a more um telephoto lens than that is also a bit of a distortion of reality and i i like that other look right i i like that sort of creamy background and a little bit unreal um it doesn't look like oh i just walked up to this place and took a photo it looks different it looks sort of magical somehow it looks otherworldly so um i really like that look um and i've pushed on it for a long time um you know to see exactly what i can do with it maybe um you know maybe a, a, a wider angle lens is a better tool for a lot of the time but um you know when you're on when you're out there and it's like you can bring one it just tends to be the one that i grab most often mm. I also think what's so beautiful is when I look at your images, I could almost feel like I'm connecting with the birds or the birds in your images. There's something like you really are managed to to photograph their their personalities almost. And it's like that lens gives you the opportunity to do that by getting so close to them. And yeah, I just I love how how you manage to create that in your images, this idea of Mm, I really understand that bird and it's like you, you capture these moments that are just so beautiful and so fleeting and um, I think you mentioned in, in that documentary as, as well again you know that you can sit out there for for hours can't you and just be watching one or two birds or one or two flock of birds and it's almost like you can get lost in that moment can't you Absolutely. And I, I really appreciate that you said that, um, that you feel sometimes like you understand that bird. I put a lot of energy, um, not only in the field, but also in the selection of images into really creating empathy. I think that's a really important thing um, for wildlife photographers to do is to create some sense of empathy with the subject. Um, and that's something that... Um, you know, that's what I don't get in, in when I do landscape photography is that subject that I'm going to put, be able to put myself in their shoes, right? I really want people to step into the photo and feel like they are that bird for a minute, right? Like I really want them to see themselves and I want them to empathize with the creature and think about their environment and think about, um, think of them as a living, you know, as I've said before, as a thinking, feeling creature that they can relate to. And so I spend a lot of time um, thinking about how to, you know, slurp the viewer right into the scene, even though it's a scene that might not feel real, realistic, right? Um, I want them to feel like they're, you know, they're there, like for a moment. Um, and so I appreciate that, that you said that, and that it's sometimes um, is working. <laughs> yes, no, it definitely is. And I think when you also look at your images and then also 
put that together with the story of what's happening with with the Great Salt Lake, you almost you feel that empathy for those birds. You know that is their home, and you can see they're taking that rest. They're they're eating, they're bathing, they're they're wading around, and they're having like this moment of calm and tranquility, which is further enhanced by the times of day and the weather conditions that you photograph in. And then when you put it together with the story, it's almost like for us humans, it evokes that emotion of look at this beautiful place, look at the birds. Look how relaxed and calm they are and they're just doing their thing. And imagine if that was taken away. I feel like, what do you think? Have you got plans for for where your your imagery is going with this? Or are you just enjoying telling the story and connecting with it while it's still there? Um, A little bit of both. I'm I'm aware of this dichotomy between, um, you know, you want to create these beautiful images, you want people to fall in love with the place, you want them to fall in love with the creatures, you want them to invest their heart in this place. And at the same time, then you want to galvanize people to do something about it. Um, But of course, you don't want to push too hard on either end or you lose people, right? Like if you're constantly like, it's terrible, they're dying, uh, you know, give money, um, you know, contact your legislators, right? Like if you're just sounding that horn um, too often, I think, um, you know, it, it, it can be a bit much and people turn away and they get bummed out and they don't want to hear it anymore. So I try to keep, um, you know, I try to keep some balance, um, but I am very thoughtful Um, about, yes, I want my images, even the ones that I might just post without any sort of commentary about the lake um, or any calls to action, I still want that to be serving the purpose of keeping people engaged and keeping people thinking about it and and reminding them of, you know, the beauty that's there. Um, And then occasionally, you know, making a bigger, a bigger plea or a bigger ask or even just an educational post like, hey, did you know this cool, fascinating fact? Right. Um, So I do spend a lot of time thinking about that Um, as far as like, where am I going? I wish I knew uh, better. Right. Like I wish I had a stronger sense of what was next. Um, I am pretty goal oriented. And, um, you know, other than like, I want to save the lake. Um, I don't have a really strong um, sense of like how to do that or how to leverage the photography to its maximum potential to help. Um, So, you know, I've dabbled a little bit in, um, you know, having maybe a gallery series of gallery showings or, you know, the social media obviously um, created some other types of media, like the little um, documentary uh, video that you watched. Um, I've contributed some photos to magazines, but haven't really headed in any of those directions, like with with full force. Um, so I don't know if you got any good ideas for me. Let me know. <laughs> well, I was just thinking there. I think because I, I you, there's this almost disconnect, I guess, with some of the the local people in terms of seeing it as almost like a wasteland and maybe not seeing the the beauty within it. It's all. I almost feel that there needs to be a visual representation of the beauty that the lake has to offer in local areas, so that the local community can be like, "Wow, I've never yeah. seen this lake like this before." And yes. really, it's only the local people. I know it's a big, obviously global issue what what we're speaking about here but if the local people can fall in love with what's on their doorstep and in their area then that's where I guess the community can come together to really passionately do things so I think maybe your idea of gallery showings or some sort of exhibition could be quite exciting yes thank you for that yeah absolutely I think that um, even though you know the birds are global citizens and they don't know that um, it's the Utah State Legislature that holds their fate you know in their hands um, I think that the local people need to know that Um, and it's really local action because it's most of the watershed is within the state of Utah so and with even within like five counties in the state of Utah so it's a pretty small geographic like political area that controls what's going on here Um, and so Absolutely. I do um, spend a lot of time trying to get local people to think about the lake as not a wasteland, but as a place, as, as a natural wonder, right? Like Utah is just full of natural wonders. We have all these national parks, Zion, um, Arches, you know, Yellowstone's not far away. Um, like we're right in the middle of this incredibly spectacular um, landscape. And yet the one that's on our doorstep is equally phenomenally crazy, you know, just absolutely crazy um, natural wonder, but 
people don't see it that way. It's just that gross, you know, mess down there that we'd rather not think about. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. Um, local, changing the hearts and minds locally um, is a big, um, hopefully a big part of what I'm trying to do. Yeah, yeah. And I wish you all the success with it because it's uh, you've got a very, yeah, a very g- good message with all of this. It's a beautiful imagery to, to showcase. And of course, photographs can say a hundred, if not a thousand words, you know, just by, by an image. And we all feel that that emotion and especially when it's something living, as we've discussed um, with birds. And one thing I'd love to just finish on is, you know, it, of course, the, the lake is forever changing with different light, different weather, different moods. And I guess with the seasons as well, you get different bird species coming in and out as as well but what keeps you from not getting fed up or a little bit bored of going back to the same place I'm I'm guessing it's it's linked to this diversity but also your mindset and this purpose but I'd love to hear um, from you you know what is it that keeps you coming back and stops you from getting bored of photographing the same place over and over again Well, uh, that's a great question. I mean, sometimes I do show up and I'm like, what am I doing here again? You know, like I've done this. But um, as as you said, a part of it is just the birds and the seasons uh, and the conditions are always different. Um, After going out there, you know, hundreds of days, I can count maybe on one hand, like the truly incredibly spectacular conditions um, that I've experienced out there. So there's always sort of the chance that you're going to come up with something that you never could have imagined you would have seen, right? Um, So, you know, there's just a handful of those days that's like winning the lottery. It was like I showed up and this crazy thing happened that I could never have planned. Um, So you just have to show up. It's kind of like you've got to be there and you, you know, you've got to be there. And maybe something amazing will happen and maybe it'll be just like another portrait session with an American avocet, which is never a bad thing, you know. Um, But uh, yeah, so there's a little bit of that, like, what am I going to see? There's also a lot of like, this is my project and this is what I do. Um, A little bit of just sort of like momentum. Um, But also I'm still learning. And so, uh, you know, I'll think of like, oh, I should try walking to this spot, um, you know, in the lake itself is changing constantly. So it's almost like every time I go out, I'm scouting a new location, um, you know, because we've had just with the water levels and, and then the birds and, and I'm learning and growing as a photographer. So it's like, oh, well, I went and I did this thing, but I didn't really understand how this particular type of lighting could be in this scenario. So now that I do know that, I'm going to go back and try it again. So um yeah, I guess at some point I'll probably get tired of it. But um, so far, so far I'm finding um, between the combination of, you know, the animals always having interesting behaviors, the seasonality of their migration, um, you know, lighting conditions, storms, that sort of thing. Haven't gotten bored yet. I'm starting, like I said, I'm starting to pull out different lenses and try and capture the same scenes with different perspective, um, many more types of perspectives. Um, cause I've, um, maybe, you know, maybe overdone the like low angle portrait, I mean, not overdone, but like, okay, I have a lot of that now, you know, like maybe I should try, um, and then new techniques. Like I'd really love to, um, do some more with intentional camera movement and, you know, I, I've tried a little bit and haven't had a tremendous amount of success with that, but, um, you know, I could see, um, just, working on different techniques and different lenses and, you know, different equipment um, as being a potentially like endless source of interest. And then the other thing that I've um, started doing is flipping over to the video um, mode and starting to take videos. And man, that talk about starting over, right? Like, oof, if I thought I had figured it all out, like now I have, I'm a complete beginner again. So, you know, mm. Video adds a whole new dynamic to things, doesn't it? But mm-hmm. I, I'm always thinking, going back to this gallery exhibition idea, maybe if you had some a video to showcase amongst all your photographs to really have that motion. Again, people can be drawn yeah. into the video and be like, wow, look at the birds taken off or look at this or look at that. And then in that combination with the images, it's, yeah, it's a would be a beautiful combination to consider. Yeah, absolutely. And when I see, you know, a beautiful video, like it tells more about that creature, you know, than you can tell in so many stills. It tells a different story, right? Um, They have their own um, 
video versus stills, they have their own magic um, to them, but they're complementary for sure. And so it's a tool I'd like to have um, in the tool belt. So slowly, you know, flipping that switch and starting to work on video and I have to start accumulating more gear as well. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I've got to say, I, I love your images and I'm always excited to see what, what photographs you're going to post next because they're they're truly beautiful. And for anybody that, that would like to, to, to look into your work and, and see your images, I wondered if you could, could let everybody know where they can go to connect with you. Sure. I'm um, most active on Instagram. It's M.A. Karen Photos. Um, and I also have a website, which is maybe less current, but still reasonably current. It's MarianneKaren.com. And, um, you know, I have like a pretty minimal presence on Facebook and um, maybe one day I'll have a YouTube channel, but not to speak of just yet. Yes. Well, who knows what the future holds, eh? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Marianne. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak with you. Thanks, Kim. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this week's podcast. It really does mean the world to me. If you'd like to get further involved with Photographic Connections, including joining our online community, you can find all the details at photographicconnections.com. I'm also very soon going to be releasing dates for immersive photography weekends in the northeast of Scotland, where I'm based, for 2024. So if you'd potentially be interested in coming here and taking part in a lovely mindful photography weekend out in nature, while you're on the website, feel free to sign up to our newsletter. We'll be one of the first people to be notified. And now that this podcast has come to an end, there's only one thing left for you to do. It's time to pick up your camera and head outdoors. There's so many incredible photographic opportunities just waiting for you to discover. <laughs>